So it's time for Millie Shand, who is editor-in-chief of Concordia International Equestrian Magazine and presents our, our Alliance for Horse Welfare in Sports and the 46 recommendations of the French Assembly to the International Olympic Committee. Thank you for your hard work, Millie. The floor is yours. Um, thank, you, thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Ava. And thank you, Ava, for inviting me here on behalf of the Alliance for Horse Welfare in Sport. It's easy for me to feel <clears throat> intimidated in the company of today's speakers. And you may be wondering why someone without a PhD has been asked to speak. Well, it's because for over 30 years, I was very much part of the mainstream equestrian industry, but I'm now an outspoken advocate for horse-centered equine sports. This is me in a former life. This foundation gave me an insight into a world that I increasingly became at odds with. My attitude changed from accepting the system to feeling uncomfortable in the system to fighting the system. Don't get me wrong, I loved competing and I met many competitors and trainers who I liked and admired. But sadly, inhumane training methods are practiced and at best they are ignored by those in authority and in many cases they're encouraged by reward. In those later years in that world, I felt increasingly isolated, but through social media, media I got in contact with like-minded trainers around the world and in 2015 started a group that we called Concordia Equestrians. Fast forward <coughs> nine years and Concordia Equestrians are a community of horse people who share a set of principles and support each other. Concordia International Equestrian Magazine is produced by a 15 strong production team, all working pro bono to promote horse welfare through science and compassion. One of the people who gave me and many other like-minded people the most support is Caroline Hegarty. Caroline felt frustrated and helpless because the professionals who she relied upon gave her conflicting advice. <clears throat> and as a result of this predicament, she created Equidopia producing and sharing professional videos and courses where the trainers would only share tried and tested evidence-based information that would benefit both horse and human. The Alliance for Horse Welfare in Sport only came to be thanks to Caroline Haggerty. Having turned her back on a highly successful career, Caroline literally gives her time, energy and resources to focus purely on improving horse welfare. This has been at great personal cost, both emotionally and financially. And I hope that you will appreciate and support her extraordinary work. Caroline only led by example, but the FBI's cynical contempt for the welfare of competition horses finally got to her. And she phoned me up declaring, that's it. It's time for a revolution. Caroline's idea was to bring together a handful of powerful and vocal advocates to pull their skills and voices and create an international alliance that would raise awareness of bad practices and lobby for rules to be made and enforced that truly protect horses. <clears throat> The AHWS is now established and the organisations behind it are represented by six tenacious women. And tenacious is quite the perfect word for us because we are indeed extremely persistent, stubborn, relentless and enduring. Caroline Hegarty, Ava von Avermatt, Alina Palachev, Shelby Dennis, Christina Wilkins and I are working together to grow the AHWS into an internationally recognized advocating organization for the welfare of all horses in sport. Our mission is to raise awareness of aversive practices and lobby for science-based and compassionate training and care for all horses that are used for entertainment and sport. We will use the leverage of social license 
to get governments to legislate for ethical horse, horse practices and equestrian governing bodies to ensure that welfare rules are genuinely upheld. It will take time to change perceptions and eradicate the irrational disassociation between that which is acceptable for pets and that which is acceptable for horses. The greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. This quote is rightly or wrongly attributed to Mahatma Gandhi. But in fact, but it's the fact that Western countries accept the sentience of animals and legislate for their welfare. The perpetrator of this crime was prosecuted as they would probably have been if they had strapped close the mouth of a rabbit, a sheep, or a fox. And yet, strap a horse's nose shut, tie his tongue down, whip him to go faster, kick him with metal prongs, or make him work with his head in hyperflexion, and the industry moves its publicity machine to gaslight the public into thinking that this is somehow just fine. Our competition horses live like kings. So much to do. Where do we start? We decided that a good place to start would be the Paris Olympic Games. To call for the International Olympic Committee to uphold the 46 recommendations of the French National Assembly to make Paris 2024 the Olympic Games of Horse Welfare. Our campaign would highlight each of the 46 equine welfare recommendations that had already been published by the French National Assembly. These recommendations are a result of the Dombreval report, a report that contains and con uh, the, co uh, the conclusions of a study group presided by Louis Dombreval, deputy of Maritime Alps. So, we initiated an online petition and a social media campaign. This campaign will be ongoing to raise awareness and have each of the 46 recommendations of the Dombreval report put into place in time um, for the 2028 Los Angeles Olympic Games and enforced not just at Olympic level, but at all international competitions. With a knock-on effect of greater horse welfare practice right across the horse industries and to the grassroots level of competition. The recommendations and the reasoning behind them are shared in full in our campaign magazine. Translated to English by Christina Wilkins, the magazine also links to the original French text. Under 10 principal headings, it includes a summary and detailed analysis of each of the 46 recommendations. My verbal presentation will give you an overview and look into a selection of those recommendations. The full version, as reproduced in some of the slides that I'm about to show you, can be read online or downloaded. It's all free of charge. So I guess what I'm saying is, don't try to read all this text. Sit back, look at the photos, and save your reading for later. The first two areas of concern relate to horse comfort and safety in relation to stable management, with measures including access to outdoor relaxation areas, large and comfortable stables, and social contact while respecting biosecurity. The FEI already has welfare rules in place, but these are not necessarily enforced. Monitoring and compliance recommendations would see that concrete and dissuasive measures are in place to ensure that the rules are respected and deviations sanctioned if necessary. This includes 24-7 surveillance by purposely trained vets and stewards and the setting up of an Olympic 
Equine Welfare Committee, made up of independent experts authorised to move freely throughout the Equestrian Olympic site as part of the special Equine Welfare at the Olympic Games mission. Now, we get down to the thorn in the side of the FEI, something that is continu that continually is causing problems for them and something that they refuse to address in any meaningful way. Why that is exactly is another story. As if it wasn't already obvious, scientists, scientific studies have proved that tight or snug nose bands cause pain, injuries and stress. The response of the FEI and national bodies who run under FEI rules has been to have the stewards check the nose band tightness with one finger at the side of the face. Reluctantly, I tried tightening a cavison nose band on my horse until I couldn't get anything under it at the nasal ridge. But at the side of the horse's face, I could still insert my entire hand under the nose band and I could turn it sideways. Of course, this will be different and depend on the confirmation of each horse's jaw, but it still makes a mockery of the FBI's cynical testing strategy. The Don Breville report recommends that noseband controls are improved with calibrated and randomly performed checks using a 1.5 ISIS taper at the nasal ridge during and after events with penalties applied in the event of infringement. Tap that can cause harm or discomfort by its creative design, all manufacture should be prohibited, in particular nose bands that have an increased capacity to be tightened, for instance, crank nose bands. This one simple check and change to the implementation of existing rules could have a profound knock-on effect to all areas of welfare. Because when the horse can open his mouth, even by the modest degree that is recommended here, it would be clear that the horse is or isn't accepting the bit, which takes us nicely to the next heading. Bits, mouthpieces and reins. In dressage, there is a list of authorised bits, while in jumping across country, there are no restrictions, despite the fact that specialists describe some bits as causing pain. Of course, all bits can cause pain, especially gags, twisted bits and combination bits. The Dombreville report recommends banning all bits that do not align with equine welfare and creating a list of authorised mouthpieces. On to reins. And at any advanced level, riders should be able to make do without martingales and draw reins. They are a bad model for all lower level riders who do not understand the potential dangers these reins pose to horses. The report recommends banning the use of martingales in combination with gag bits. However, it also recommends that gag bits are outlawed. Draw reins and running reins that run from the girth to the hand of the rider passing through the bit tend to enforce a hyperflexed posture, if the one used by riders of a high level. Any form of auxiliary rein should be banned throughout the entire Olympic Games precinct. Tight straps over the hind leg tendons make the horse jump more cleanly cleanly over fences. These boots are banned for young horses, so the FEI recognises that they are wrong. The report is calling for a total ban, as well as a tabletop checks of all tack and protective equipment. Striking a horse with a whip is always badly perceived by the general public. As a side note, British show jumping have edited their rule book to call whips <coughs> padded batons and refer to using them on horses. In my view, this is just gaslighting and a cynical use of language 
to make everyone feel better about whipping. The report says that ideally whipping should be absent from competition at this level altogether and recommends that the whip is prohibited from being used more than once per event and more than twice during the warm up. With video surveillance use as evidence if necessary and over whipping resulting in a sanction or even disqualification. With regard to spurs, the report says that they must be used with precision and moderation and recommends that they should be optional in all events and never mandatory with tack checked, rules upheld and belly bands banned. In practicing saying that, it's really difficult. So, next one. There are 11 recommendations for veterinary care and checks and the report goes into some detail over how and why these are vital for horse welfare. As with human athletes, science is used by cheats to improve performance. But as a result, health and well-being is compromised. The recommendations are based around increased and random testing for any banned drugs that are performed performance enhancing, including substances that mask pain, substances that induce sensitivity to pain, or substances that reduce sensitivity to pain. Testing should be in line with human athletics, where 20% of the testing is at the competition and 80% is in between competitions. It is against the rules for horses to compete following neurectomy, otherwise known as denerving either permanently by surgical section or temporarily with anaesthetic blocks of, of the nerve trunks. By artificially and dangerously masking pain, this practice is considered a form of doping. It is prohibited in competition because it can have dramatic consequences for the horse. The loss of limb sensitivity modifies perception of the effort and can lead to fatigue fractures or the aggravation of existing injuries. French horses have to have any medical or surgical intervention of this type logged on their identification documents. However, this is not the case in other countries. Notably, the FEI has taken this problem into account with veterinary doctor Morgane Chambord giving sensitivity tests to horses competing, but as yet only in endurance races. Dr. Schramble has been working for a long time on the development of a neurectomy detection system. New work rules would therefore require a veterinary certificate to clarify, certify that all FEI competition horses have not undergone this intervention, or they take the risk that they do not respond to sensitivity tests, which would lead to disqualification. In 2021, there was a devastating outbreak of rhino pneumonia, also known as equine herpes virus, at an international competition. The recommendations call for everything to be done to ensure that this does not happen again, including a call to increase the number of analysis laboratories for the Olympic Games. Another recommendation is to remove from competition any horses with a medical history that is not compatible with an optimal state of health that has to be verified in advance by the FEI vets. In other words, a horse would need a clean bill of health before it shipped to the competition venue. To assist in the case of suspected lameness or subsequent accidents of disputes and for education purposes, it is recommended that veterinary controls, pre-competition checks and sensitivity tests are all vid videoed to enable viewing in slow motion. Recommendation number 29 is to impose the immediate stopping of a ride at the slightest trace of blood on the horse 
and eliminate the horse from the rest of the competition. I think this is already in place. Although there's generally an official excuse for the blood that exonerates both the rider and the federation. He bit his tongue. He has a rare skin condition that makes his sides bleed easily. It's just a nosebleed. All blood, it would seem, is just rotten bad luck. Now, the report turns to the four equestrian events that will be held in Paris. The dressage world complains that they're picked on for the use of hyperflexion. And it has to be said that they are certainly not, they are certainly not the only discipline that works horses this way. But perhaps it is the one discipline that keeps horses in these unnatural and forced frames for prolonged lengths of time. Whatever the reason, hyperflexion comes under the dressage heading. Over four pages in our campaign magazine, we share the translated text that outlines the reasons why hyperflexion is harmful both physically and mentally on the well-being of the horse. I don't think that it is necessary at this conference to go into any more details on the welfare issues. But at this point, I would like to thank Ava and her tireless work in this area. <coughs> I would also like to thank Crispin Parolius Johannesson for allowing us to use his excellent photographs. Without Ava and Crispin, we would definitely not be in the position we are, with a growing awareness of what constitutes good and bad practice. The International Society for Equitation Science names hyperflexion as any position of the nasal plane behind the vertical, recommending that the FEI always prioritise its regulations. To watch any FEI sport, but especially dressage, one might be surprised to learn that the FEI themselves state that the nose of the horse must always be maintained on or in front of the vertical. Explicitly, explicitly in its guidelines, it says, the pole is the highest point. The nose line is in front of the vertical. And it states that the positioning of the muzzle behind the vertical testifies to too strong a hand action or incorrect training. If only they practiced what they preached. The recommendations for the Paris Olympics is to enforce the prohibition of intentional or unintentional infliction of unnecessary suffering or discomfort and of an overly constrained posture or frame. This would prohibit any flexion of the neck that places the nose line behind the vertical throughout the Olympic grounds and apply sanctions with immediate effect for all equestrian <coughs> disciplines. The concerns for show jumping focus on two areas, the three horse team format and the heat and light conditions that horses are expected to perform in. The three horse format puts an obligation on the rider to finish the course no matter the cost to their horse. <coughs> the Dombreval report calls for the return of the pre-Tokyo Olympic Games show jumping format of four rider horse pairs per team with a drop score and to reschedule the individual events to after the team events. For horse welfare, the report also recommends that show jump events should be held in daylight while avoiding the hottest periods of the day. The recommendations for eventing so focus solely on safety. The cross country phase takes the lives of both horses and riders. The report notes that four horses were killed in international events in 2021 alone. While praising the steps already taken, the recommendations include full treks on the clinical condition of horses before they are allowed to enter the Olympic Games. 
support and collaboration with manufacturers to produce equipment to better protect both horse and rider, 100% frangible obstacles designed to collapse in the event of a fall or impact, and fences profiles to have no protruding parts. Access to quality of the cross-country course surface using the most up-to-date technology. That's assessed, not access. The modern pentathlon equestrian event at the Tokyo Olympic Games was a real disaster in terms of the sports image. So much so that the modern pentathlon federation has decided to stop the equestrian events after the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. When they will be replaced by a head-to-head -head sprint obstacle race of only human athletes. In the meantime, the FEI's own safety and welfare rules must be strictly adhered to. The report also recommends that each rider gets to know their horse 24 hours prior to the event and that there's a different horse assigned to each rider. Furthermore, the obstacle should be lowered to a maximum height of 110 centimetres. In view of the long tradition of French excellence in horse riding, the Paris 2024 Games must exemplify the respect and well-being of the horse. French equestrian organisations have drawn up an equine welfare charter which should be implemented together with the Good Practice Guide. An equine welfare scoring system is recommended with the mission entrusted to the Welfare Committee, composed of independent experts who would carry out their work on site via video surveillance. Bringing this presentation to a close, we believe that there can be a future for equestrian sport, but only one where the well-being of the horse is put as the highest priority. As public awareness is raised of both good and bad practices, the malevolent element of horse sports will undoubtedly be outlawed because of social license. When we see riders who genuinely care about their horses, we see it in deeds, not just words. We see riders looking for the least aversive tag and training methods and aspiring to partnership, lightness and harmony. The thanks of the Alliance for Horse Welfare and Sport goes to everyone who supported us and our campaign. Special thanks goes to Loic Dombreval and his team for compiling the report and the French National Assembly for their 46 recommendations to make Paris 2024 the Olympic Games of Horse Welfare. Thank you very much, Millie.